Good afternoon and welcome everyone. It is my great, great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this important conversation, Corporate Commitments to Support Entrepreneurs of Color. We acknowledge that this event honors Black History Month, but these are conversations we have and frankly should be having every month of the year. I'm Tammy Halevi and I co-lead the Reimagine Main Street Initiative. Reimagine Main Street is a multi-stakeholder cross-sector initiative focused on ensuring an equitable recovery from the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on small businesses and the people they employ on MLK Boulevard, Cesar Chavez Ways, Chinatowns and main streets across the country. In March of 2020, when the shelter in place orders were first issued, we knew that black, Latino and AAPI entrepreneurs would be hit disproportionately hard. And so we assembled a broad and diverse group of stakeholders to share information and problem solve responses. Over time, the initiative has evolved. We continue to host the network and we also generate data-driven insights into the needs of diverse small businesses and their workers and we host meetings like this one. This session is one in a regular series of events to engage policymakers, small business owners, and small business ecosystem participants across the country in dialogue. Today's conversation is critical and timely. Uh, corporations are increasingly looked at to, for leadership and represent a cornerstone of the American economy providing employment as well as products and services to millions of Americans. Across a range of industries, many companies responded to the resurgent movements for so racial justice in the wake of the senseless murder of George Floyd with commitments to black owned small businesses and to other entrepreneurs of color. When Felicia Brown and her colleagues at ARP suggested that we examine these commitments with an eye toward assessing where we are today and looking ahead, our team was all in. Thankfully, we've assembled an extraordinary group of senior leaders across government, industry, advocacy, and philanthropy to share their experiences and insights, to engage in some lively dialogue, and to make recommendations for what should come next. There is much to discuss, so let's move right into it. But first, uh, one housekeeping note, we are recording this event and we're also live streaming via Facebook in addition to the Zoom. The recording will be distributed afterwards and will be available at reimaginemainstreet.org and on the AARP Small Business Resource Center website. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Felicia Brown, a senior advisor for entrepreneurship, work and jobs at AARP, who makes the magic happen for 50 plus entrepreneurs and has been a terrific partner in creating this event and much more. Welcome Felicia and thank you to you uh, for your leadership and continued partnership. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you for that introduction. And so, you know, AARP is committed to supporting older Americans who own or want to own and start a small business through programming, research, and the hosting of events such as this. We believe that entrepreneurship can be a path to helping individuals achieve financial security and help close the wealth gap. Because this is a, such an important conversation to have at this moment and at this time, we are thrilled to partner with Reimagine Main Street to bring this amazing lineup of senior leaders from across the government, corporations, and advocacy. To kick off our conversation today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jean Axius, my colleague. He is the Senior Vice President of Global Thought Leadership at AARP. He uh, leads our AARP's disparity strategy, which I'm proud to be a member of, aimed to reduce the health and wealth gaps within and among communities of color. He is an internationally recognized thought leader on aging, longevity, equity, health systems, infrastructure, and transformation. And he has a strong track record of developing innovative and actionable solutions policies and programs to close the opportunity gap that everyone and so everyone can live longer, healthier and more productive lives. Jean, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Felicia, for that. I am extremely excited to be having this conversation and even more so honored to introduce Janice Butler, who's going to be joining me. Uh, many of you know Janice, she is the first counselor for racial equity at the US Treasury, uh, Department of Treasury. 
Uh, Janice has spent the last two decades advancing economic uh, equity solutions uh, for communities of color and breaking down the barriers that underpin the disparities that we so often see, particularly in wealth and financial security by race and also by gender. Uh, she is a national, international renowned uh, leader, having worked across uh, local levels of government, as well as national advocacy and international philanthropy. Uh, she spent the last 10 years at UNIDOS, uh, which is back then uh, known as National Council of La Raza, advocating for economic mobility opportunities for Latino families. Uh, prior to then, uh, she was the president of the J.P. Morgan Chase and Company Foundation. Uh, so Janice brings a wealth of experience across the sectors, and I am deeply honored to be having this conversation with you uh, today, Janice. How are you? Well, Janice, I think you might be on. Sorry, I'm. Oh, classic. We're still here. I'm so sorry, but yeah. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Janice, I am deeply honored uh, and really want to kind of get right in. Uh, you have an amazing track record, uh, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for the last two weeks uh, because of just the amazing work that you've done across industries and sectors to really uh, break down a lot of these barriers that we often see. It's fair to say that the last 20 plus months or so has been uh, traumatic for all of us. Uh, and we've seen the devastating toll this pandemic has had, both in terms of the health, but also the economic uh, disparities that we've seen, particularly for communities of color, and especially particularly those who are entrepreneurs. Uh, so you were appointed uh, to be the first ever counselor for racial equity at the US Department of Treasury. Uh, can you tell our audience about this role and what it means that your office was established? Yes, absolutely. Well, and first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I want to greet and thank all of the audience that are listening on our live stream. So many of you every day are out there making our MLK boulevards, our Cesar Chavez ways, our Chinatowns, our Koreatowns, like all of our neighborhoods really come to life. And so I want to thank you for what you all are doing uh, for our country and for our economy every day. Um, I also, I'm, I, it's hard to express like how humbled and ecstatic um, and meshing those two emotions together I am to serve in this role as counselor for racial equity. I am extremely honored to be joining an administration that ran on a commitment to racial equity and then joining a treasury department that started actioning against that commitment on day one. And Jean, you mentioned this at the top, but I think it's important to understand that this administration was taking office, you know, really what was just months after the murder of George Floyd. And I think one of the important things about my role is we're, we're trying to think about how do you institutionalize this perspective of racial equity as for some, those incidents are further and further in the rear view mirror. Many of us live with this and incidents like it every single day, but we have to keep it at the forefront of public consciousness and we need to build the racial equity perspective into our institutions. And so that's really my role here at Treasury. I'm thinking across all of our, all of our levers on policy, program, the business of Treasury and thinking about how do we use all of these levers to advance an agenda, to create an economy that really works for everyone, acknowledging that our economy really hasn't worked for broad members of our, of our communities, for black people, for brown people, and we need to make that right. So I'm trying to align all of the different resources available at Treasury to advance that agenda. Well, again, I love what you just said in terms of institutionalizing uh, racial equity within our institutions. And I think your point is well taken that uh, given where we are relative to what we've been through, how do we continue to uh, accelerate the pace of change? Uh, because COVID did not create a lot of these uh, disparities that we, we've seen, it's amplified them. And it's fair to say to your point, uh, last uh, in 2020, we've had a series of crises that has occurred uh, at the same time. What would you say are some of the commitments, particularly for the U.S. Treasury, has made in advancing racial equity uh, and for small businesses? Yeah, let me um, mention a few. I know we have a short time and I could really go on and on about the work of this department. 
Uh, but there, there are a few programs in particular as part of the American Rescue Plan that I wanna highlight. Um, first, and really important to everybody on this call is the state and local fiscal, fiscal relief funds. We know that cities and localities were hit really hard, having to respond on multiple fronts to the, the dynamic crisis that was COVID, as well as the racial reckoning, biggest one we've seen in, in more than a generation, right? And cities' budgets were hit hard, their capacity was challenged, not just the big cities, but the small ones as well, all across the country. And the fiscal, the state and local fiscal relief funds were really designed to give localities the flexibility that they need to target who is disproportionately impacted by COVID, assess and diagnose those needs and respond accordingly. And I think that flexibility is really important to achieving equity objectives. It's not all like a, um, like a one size fits all or a silver bullet here. You've gotta be able to be nimble and meet your community where, where it is. So state or states and localities could use those funds to support extra housing vouchers, to support education, to make mental health interventions, a variety of different use cases. And Treasury wrote the rules in such a way that we emphasize community and stakeholder input into those plans and is collecting regular reports so that we can see those um, equity act aspects in action. Um, two other big ones that I'll quickly mention that probably a lot of people on this, uh, this webinar are really familiar with, but the Emergency Capital Investment Program, ESIP, and the State Small Business Credit Initiative, SSBCI, are two incredible vehicles to support the flow of community and mission-oriented financing to, in the case of ESIP, to support small business, but also much more broadly in terms of community infrastructure. Uh, and then the State Small Business Credit Initiative really designed to um, address a gap in access to credit for small business. Um, that, uh, the guidance is out to states. We've actually just received plans back from states and we'll be making uh, assessments uh, on those plans going forward. I think really important to know is that 1.5 billion of the 10 billion SSBCI commitment is reserved for socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. And so this is a big difference from the 1.0 version of this program to have a very targeted approach to reaching um, those that have been historically left out of small business capital programs. Um, do I have time to sneak in one more? You have time to okay. sneak absolutely. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going quickly so I can I can do follow-ups on this, but another one that maybe is, is less on the radar of folks, but I think is really important and speaks to, um, to Treasury's commitment is the, the economic impact um, payments that went out uh, early on as, as part of um, uh, earlier stimulus. We, we, those were pushed out, right? These are important payments to um, augment lost income for families, really allow families to stay afloat, buy food, pay for rent, um, smooth over job loss. Folks are probably familiar that uh, essentially the way IRS approached administering those payments is starting with those tax filers that had tax information on record and then had a major push from there as well as with the child tax credit to reach those that do not have a tax filing obligation. So it's a major effort by, uh, by the department to reach as many vulnerable individuals that were eligible for the economic impact payments and child tax credit. What we don't know is what the demographic breakout are, uh, is of those people who received uh, those income support. And so Treasury is actually in the middle of trying to model and better understand the demographic breakout of, of EIPs. This is, it sounds a little wonky, but it is incredibly important for us to be able to more accurately assess and understand the extent to which tax benefits that are administered through the tax system actually are equitably dispersed. And we've not had that feedback loop before. So, it's a little wonky, but I mention it because 
at the top, I said our goal is really to think about how we are institutionalizing a perspective and weaving it throughout the building. Not only is the tax system incredibly important to advancing a more equitable economy, but building these tools and these, the ability to do this analysis, I hope is going to create a feedback loop that makes our policies that much stronger. Janice, I really appreciate that uh, the points that you shared, not only the range of resources, but also uh, the point around data uh, and really understanding uh, who is being served. Uh, and I think that's so critically important because of the fact that in, in, in order to address issues of equity, we have to have data that not just identify where the gaps are, but also tells us what the magnitude of the challenges are. And then when you also create interventions, you're actually able to see to what extent are those interventions addressing uh, some of the challenges that we see. Uh, in the last five minutes, uh, I, I wanna kind of uh, end with how we uh, kind of kicked off. Uh, you're an amazing leader who've done a tremendous work across sectors. Um, and we have several uh, people on who's watching and listening to this conversation in corporate America today. And we also have advocates uh, who's listening to this conversation. Uh, what would you advise them in terms of what they could potentially be doing to address the racial wealth gap, uh, whether it's as a corporate leader or, or even as an advocate? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that question. Let me start by saying that it is critical that we work together. The, the problem as as large and persistent and multi-generational as addressing the racial wealth divide is not going to be solved just by one sector alone. We have to have our corporate community, our small businesses, our nonprofits, our government at every level really rowing in the same direction in order to tackle this problem. And it was a big reason why having worked in the nonprofit advocacy space, having worked in direct service, um, having worked in, uh, in corporate philanthropy, I really wanted to come into government and understand and think about how I use my skill set to, um, to make change through, um, through this posture. When I look at what we're currently doing through the American Recovery Program, the, the federal government has made incredible investments, even just the two or three that I mentioned, right? With ESIP and SFBCI, you're approaching $20 billion of investment into the community development finance system. We know that corporations, according to a McKinsey report from sometime last year, apologies, I can't remember exactly when it was from, corporates have committed about $200 billion to racial equity. We want to make sure that these things align. We're putting dollars out that are fortifying community development institutions that are uh, creating increased capacity for flow of dollars out to many of the people that are listening on this call. I would challenge corporations to think about how they're leveraging and aligning with that investment. And for our advocates on the call, I'd say your on the ground intelligence is incredibly important. Your eyes and ears on how this implementation is, is actually going and I, I think I can speak for the department and certainly other colleagues, that intelligence and feedback loop to us is incredibly important. So I hope that in that way, we all will be bolstering and fortifying each other's efforts. Well, Janice, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for the amazing work that you're doing with the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and thank you so much for just the lens in which you bring to this work, having worked across sectors, uh, and the call to action uh, that no one sector can do it alone, that this really truly is a partnership. And we can only close these uh, racial wealth gaps if we're working in concert together. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your uh, time today. Uh, could not thank you thank enough. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I have the great pleasure of actually uh, introducing our next panel. Uh, uh, we heard from Janice uh, the amount of uh, commitments that corporations have made over the last year, uh, uh, around $200 billion. And we're gonna actually hear from some of our corporate leaders. I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing Monique uh, Carswell. Uh, Monique is the director for the Center for Racial Equity at walmart.org. She brings over 17 years of amazing experience having worked across sectors and industries. Uh, in her role, she's actually responsible for helping steer the organization in terms of its commitment to change, not just within, but also to leverage partnerships in order to change uh, the broader ecosystem. Uh, so Monique, welcome. 
Uh, in addition to Monique, we have Fran uh, France uh, pa Pasha. Uh, France is the Senior Vice President uh, with PayPal uh, and oversees the global communications, uh, employee engagement, uh, the reputation management, government relations, and public policy functions. Uh, he also oversees PayPal's social innovation efforts, uh, working to leverage the company's uh, core capabilities to deliver meaningful impact uh, at a global scale. We also have Ted uh, Archer. Uh, Ted is, uh, excuse me for one second, uh, Ted is the executive director with uh, JP Morgan and Chase. Uh, he has uh, oversees the Global Supply Diversity uh, Program, uh, which has a, a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, Ted brings over 15 years of global experience, having built programs and partnerships that drive economic growth uh, with an emphasis particularly on underserved small businesses. So good afternoon, everyone. So we, ju we just heard uh, from uh, Janice, and I want to kind of pick up in terms of where she left off, because I knew that corporate America made a tremendous amount of commitments uh, financially, particularly to address the issue of the, uh, the racial wealth gap. Uh, I didn't really appreciate the magnitude of the amount of resources until she said $200 billion. Uh, so that's a lot of money, particularly from the private sector, uh, coupled to with what the public sector is actually doing. Uh, so I'll just like to start off and maybe we can start off with Monique to kind of walk us through uh, some of the commitments uh, that Walmart.org is making, particularly through its partnerships to address the broader issues around the wealth, uh, wealth gap. And then France and Ted, by all means, feel free to chime in. Sure. Thank you so much, Shane. I'm so excited to be having this conversation. I appreciate ARP and Reimagine Main Street for having me to discuss this important topic. So as you mentioned, I'm with the Walmart Center for Racial Equity, which is a newer division of walmart.org. And to give everyone some context, walmart.org represents the combined philanthropic efforts of Walmart and the Walmart Foundation. Um, and the way we approach our uh, equity work is that we believe, you know, if a business thrives, that's when it actually creates, creates value for society. So we focus our areas on where we can do the most good. Um, so that's combining the unique strengths of our business alongside our philanthropy. So that's the unique approach we take and the perspective that I'm bringing to the conversation today um, in terms of approaching this through philanthropy. And um, as Janice mentioned, following the tragic murder of George Floyd um, in June of 2020, Walmart doubled down on our commitment to advance equity in society by more aggressively um, driving change. And that's both inside and outside of our company um, by developing strategies and investing resources to increase fairness, equity, and justice. So all the things um, we're here to discuss specifically in four different areas. Um, we prioritize you know, addressing these inequities and within the nation's financial system is one of them. And so I specifically work with a group of leaders within Walmart called what we call the Walmart um, Shared Value Network. And we have one of those focused on finance where we're using our business capabilities to increase opportunities for diverse owned businesses um, amongst other things. And at the same time, the center is complementing those efforts through our philanthropic initiatives. And those are aimed at advancing financial inclusion and equity specifically for black owned businesses. So the strategy there is to support black entrepreneurs with existing businesses um, that supply goods and services to the retail industry. So as I mentioned, you know, we have the expertise and the ability to bring forward um, all of our knowledge and insights with the goal to help increase their readiness um, and their earnings in order to strengthen and grow their companies and the communities that they're in. And so I do this um, by, you know, working with entrepreneurial support organizations. So we provide grants and assistance to ESOs who are assisting Black-owned companies um, in accessing a couple of things. So that's capital, knowledge, markets, et cetera. Um, and we believe this will not only help the business owners, but their families build wealth, but also the entire community in which they're doing business. Because as we know, Black businesses tend to hire from within their own neighborhoods. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Well, Monique, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are looking you up on LinkedIn uh, or Instagram or any form of social media so they can try to get you, uh, your information so uh, they can tap into that network of resources. Uh, Franz, starting, uh, you know, I want to kind of connect with you because PayPal was one of the first 
among the first companies to announce a financial commitment to Black and Latino small business owners in the wake of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and many others. Can you say a little bit more about where we are and uh, some of the commitments that PayPal is actually doing in this uh, to address the racial wealth gap? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. And thank you, uh, ARP and uh, Reimagining Main Street for uh, bringing us together um, here. So, you know, when you, it, we were during the pandemic already becoming very alarmed at what was happening um, to black owned businesses during those first months of the, of the pandemic. And I think now we all know that the devastating effect of the pandemic was having an undue impact on black owned businesses. In fact, 41% of black owned businesses closed during that period of the pandemic, which was nearly double the rate of what was happening in the economy overall. And so we had started to really bear down on, you know, because we serve many small businesses um, and customers and we're very involved in um, commerce and in, in focusing on the financial health of communities all across the country. Uh, after the murder of George Floyd and the, the social unrest that followed and the fo we really understood that we had a role to play and that we had been you know, supporting um, some of the organizations that were working on reconciliation and were working in communities, but we then stepped back and thought, you know, we have a distinctive role to play and a part to play in closing the racial wealth gap and focus, focusing on long-term uh, racial equity and economic justice. So we spent really an intensive period right in sort of June of 2020 working with community leaders, working with nonprofits who we had partnerships with, speaking with uh, leaders within our company in the black community um, and in vulnerable communities. And we took an approach that we announced in June, um, which I think was, you know, it, it, we, we looked at it from a short term, a medium term and a long term perspective. And what was the distinctive role that, that PayPal could play? Um, the first thing we did to address that immediate urge is we put together a program of what we called empowerment grants, which was a $15 million um, grant fund to give small grants to Main Street Black owned businesses who were really on the edge of collapsing. Um, and we wanted to keep those businesses alive at a time when they needed it most. We were fortunate to partner with a, with a nonprofit well known to many of you, a AEO, the Association for Enterprise Opportunity, um, and it's inspiring um, team. And we bore down on the <clears throat> areas and communities by, you know, by zip code that were suffering the most, communities of color and black owned businesses in particular. And we distributed grants to 1400 businesses over the course of the next several months. 62% of those of the recipients were women. Um, I think it was about 50% were sole proprietors. So these were small Main Street businesses. And I'm proud to say that over 90% ultimately survived um, during the course of the pandemic. Um, we also understood that we needed to take a partnership approach, that the real knowledge and expertise of how to sustain um, uh, Black and Latino businesses in communities lived in the nonprofit community. And so we partnered with 20 nonprofits in the highest need areas of the country. We put about $5 million into initial partnerships to help support their work and so that we could learn um, and our employees could learn on how we could sustain uh, black owned businesses over the longer term. Um, and so we had a lot of employee volunteers, a lot of leaders of the company, you know, got involved and we really worked, we worked with some amazing nonprofits during this period and, and still are. Um, we also created a $500 million economic opportunity fund. Our total commitment that we made was $535 million of which we have you know, put all of that to work um, over the last um, you know, year and a half. That economic opportunity fund was divided between investing in high growth um, minority owned startups, investing in minority owned venture funds because we wanted to really take a long-term approach and create wealth um, in black communities and also depositing into um, community uh, minority owned banks and credit unions in the most vulnerable communities. And again, taking a partnership approach 
and really trying to work in communities. We also knew we had work to do inside of PayPal and that the, this period of self-awareness, we wanted to also make sure that we were walking the talk internally. Um, and we took a $15 million part of the fund and worked on supporting our employee resource groups, um, especially those that were working in communities um, where PayPal employees could get involved. Um, we also started to invest in more partnerships with, um, with colleges and universities that were where we had an opportunity to work on recruitment um, and on developing careers uh, for uh, our black employees um, and other members of communities of color within PayPal. And that work continues and it, it will be, I think, everlasting work um, as we try to be become better and better at this. Thank you so much for that, Franz. Uh, Ted, you've been with JP Morgan Chase and company for, since 2016 overseeing their strategy to grow uh, diverse uh, businesses and providing tremendous amount of support uh, in that process. I would love to hear from you, uh, from your vantage point in the work that you're doing, uh, uh, some of the commitments that JP Morgan Chase has made uh, and where you see some opportunities, particularly in terms of um, growing diverse uh, businesses. Yes, uh, thank you, Gene, and uh, thank you to our friends at AARP and Reimagine Main Street for organizing us all on this platform. And Franz and Monique, it's great to be with you on this discussion as well. So Gene, as you mentioned, I I've led diverse business initiatives for about six years, uh, and I'm responsible now for our supplier diversity organization and the firm's overall supplier diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. And the fact is that you know, the existing racial wealth gap puts a strain on economic mobility and it just it limits the US economy. And so and there's enough data out there to, to demonstrate that. And some of that data we own, right? Some of that data comes from the JP Morgan Chase Institute that says that in majority black communities and uh, Latino communities that the cash buffer uh, for businesses in those communities is less than two weeks, right? So they have less than the standard 30 days that you and I uh, typically, you know, need to pay our bills. Um, and so, you know, we um, have been focused on, you know, naming the problem um, face, uh, that entrepreneurs of color, that black and brown communities face for a little bit longer um, than the recent commitment would suggest. But I, I do think it's worth um, reiterating what Monique and Franz mentioned, which was that in, in 2020, we knew we had to, to act in addition to what we had already done, we had, we had announced um, a focus on advancing Black Pathways more than a year before, but this this needed a, a special um, needed special attention. It needed a, an approach that was bold, but also really uh, took a unique look at what we could offer as far as a set of solutions. And so, in October 2020, J.P. Morgan Chase made a 30 billion dollar commitment to advance racial equity. And really the idea was that, you know, we, we can play a significant role in providing some of the solutions that break down the systemic barriers um, that, that cause uh, the inequity. Uh, so we have a tremendous portfolio in home lending, affordable housing and refinancing um, home loans, um, which you can see um, uh, on the jpmorganchase.com website, you know, slash racial equity. But in my world of small business development, I'm specifically proud to say that the firm's committed $2 billion alone towards growing Black and Latino owned businesses. And a few different things that you know you would imagine a bank can do, and some of them we've done, and they're, they're pretty, um, you would, can imagine that we could. Uh, one is that we said we would, uh, we committed to providing additional loans to small businesses in majority Black and Latino communities. But in addition to that, you know, I heard Franz talk about, you know, work with um, Black uh, and, and Latino MDIs, and we invested over 100 million in direct equity with Black and Latino owned and led minority depository institutions. We also expanded our Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, which is a collaboration with a host of CDFIs uh, led today by Local Initiative Support Corporation um, to more cities and, and made an additional $42 million investment. But really where I spend most of my time these days um, is thinking about um, and looking to advance our work around supplier diversity and in, in particular business development as it relates to supplier diversity. 
So we, in addition to what I mentioned, committed 750 million uh, towards growing black and Latino suppliers over the next five years. And to me, you know, contracts, um, procurement, you know, this is revenue that's really critical uh, and it's a great form of capital because um, you don't have to pay back. Um, it's a real lifeblood for, for any small business. And what makes um, this sort of approach notable is not the dollar figure, which admittedly is important, but I think what makes that approach important, uh, notable is that, um, you know, we are looking with the intention to grow black and brown companies through the supply chain. And so we're, we're complementing our direct spend with a set of solutions that address things like cybersecurity um, or matchmaking you know, with other large enterprise buyers to help grow the opportunities for diverse firms. And of course, our unique uh, strength in providing financial services solutions. And so to me, these are, these are things that I think a company of the size and scale um, of Jake Morgan Chase should be um, looking to leverage. Uh, but part of what um, makes this sustainable and effective is that we're doing so in partnership with communities where this work is implemented, working with partners, um, organizations that are uniquely positioned um, to drive the kind of change that are in their communities. Um, and so we're making space for that to happen along with making direct investments ourselves. Well, Ted, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, those commitments and some of the work that is being done. Uh, you uh, said something that kind of struck something in my mind, uh, and I heard that also with Franz and also Monique. Uh, and I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit uh, from some of the questions and ask you the, all of you this question, uh, that in many cases, your organizations were was on this journey prior to COVID, prior to the murder of George Floyd. And those events clearly did have a huge impact on the work that your organizations were doing. So in many cases, you doubled down uh, your efforts. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, because we're all on this journey of continued improvement, companies are all on this journey of uh, learning or hopefully creating a learning culture. Uh, what have you learned uh, over the course of the last two years since you've doubled down your commitments in terms of what is working uh, what might not be working, where you've had to pivot in order to meet your targets? Uh, I know that's a loaded question, but I think that there's an opportunity, particularly for our listeners, to uh, get a sense as to some of the tips or strategies or some of the insights you've learned uh, along the way that they can be benefactors of in terms of not repeating. Uh, who would like to take that first? France? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> First off, I have to say how, how great it is to be on a, a call with, uh, with colleagues from Walmart and J.P. Morgan. I really admire the work that, the, that they do, and we've had the opportunity to partner on a number of different fronts. Um, I, get, I guess I would say uh, two things, and then I'm curious to hear what others have learned. One is that um, it has been amazing to see the engagement of our employees and how much energy there is within the company to participate in this work to support the work, to really get involved with, uh, with our nonprofit partners, to get involved in communities, to participate in the social impact work of the company, but also to, to really bring new ideas and, um, um, and creative energy and passion to the work we're doing um, on uh, working to close the racial wealth gap. And that's been, I think, a big, a big learning. Um, and it's across the entire company at every level of our company. Um, the second is that this has to be long-term work. That you know, when when you make a grant or when you um, you know work with a nonprofit, we have to look at it as long-term. So that when we, for just as a minor, a small example, I spoke about our empowerment grants. We really stayed in the game. Um, with partners, other companies who stepped up to help support these small businesses. After that initial grant, um, we worked uh, with AEO and with other partners to be sure that we could be there to help uh, provide additional support. Um, and then it wasn't uh, one and done, that it's a long-term. And the same thing with our partnerships and with um, the way we're working with CDFIs um, and with partners. And I think that there's a there's a sustaining, sustaining partnerships and sustaining focus over time. Um, that's a learning um, that, that we're taking away from this and it will 
drive our drive our strategic approach to this going forward. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in. Go ahead, Monique. So it's you know interesting because I don't know if we can speak to the lessons learned just yet. Um, but I have a lot to say on this topic. That question was pretty big, um, but it was you know shocking and a little bit of disbelief um, to me that people were so alarmed. You know, as as of the recent um, reckoning that the wealth gap is so great, and as Ted mentioned, on track to get even worse if we don't um, intervene. So, for those of us who have been doing this work for a long time and standing in the gap, and have already had pieces of this built into other strategies, I was you know elated to see um, lots of us come together and be more vocal and be more bold with our commitments, um, even though they may or may not be considered new, but um, adding upon and building upon those so that we could drum up more awareness and increase like mobilization and action specifically um, within the business world. And in terms of opportunity, I think there were a lot of individual commitments made. And of course that is based on the attributes and the resources that we bring from each of our respective companies. Um, and I think our leaders were very thoughtful about how we can all tackle a piece of the issues um, based on where we could have you know, the greatest impact. But I do think there is greater room for collaboration. Um, and specifically within the philanthropic world, it's not um, you know, unlike us to come together and co-fund things to have the greater, deeper, longer range impact to address you know, and to bring forward interventions that will really get to ground level, um, groundwater systems change. And so that's you know, one area where I think we can definitely um, see growth and improvement. Um, Walmart's sphere of influence is wide, and that's not only in business, but um, looking at what I've you know, learned thus far, specifically within my charitable and philanthropic work, a lot of the organizations that are doing this work on the ground may have a hard time getting um, inroads and on ramps to some of, to access some of these funds. So having the validation from a company like Walmart, like PayPal, like JP Morgan helps them secure additional funding. So they get follow on fund from other organizations to help support their work. Um, so I can stop there or I can keep going on, but those are my initial thoughts. <laughs> Ted, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I, I'll I'll pick up where Monique left off. Um, as someone who also you know shares the philanthropic, um, economic development and impact lens, it really is a place where you know we are learning to continue to hone in and focus. And it's not as easy in an organization um, where you know you you're often quantitatively driven and driven from quarter to quarter to see progress and metrics. And so Monique, I, I totally get it um, where, you're, where you're coming from. We've been, I think, learning as we go to really hone in on impact. And by that, I mean, you know, we um, set out uh, to accomplish some really um, uh, high volume uh, numbers as it relates to uh, lending, as it relates to the number of individuals and businesses that we actually support and partner with. But ultimately, this is about closing the racial wealth gap. And that's measured in wealth, right? That's measured in jobs and revenue and local economic development and local impact. And that's a piece that is not as easy to come by, but it's something that we need to continue to focus on. And so we actually have dedicated um, strategies and dedicated leaders who are focused on what, what impact means locally. Uh, and as um, someone who has responsibility for supply diversity, um, those things are not often um, aligned, right? And so you, you have to work uh, to align this concept of re really um, streamlining and consolidating a procurement apparatus, but then ensuring that there is impact that is felt locally. And so that is a constant um, opportunity for us uh, to, uh, to try to address. And the way that you would address it kind of goes back uh, to where Janice uh, left her remarks, which was this has to be done in partnership. You have to forge the right kinds of sort of networks for collective action. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we learned is to focus on impact. I don't know that we've learned it all, the lesson all the way, um, but as we go with, with, with our efforts, we, we, we continually have to go back to why are we doing this and is it achieving what we set out to achieve, which is closing the racial wealth gap. 
I really appreciate this. And there was something that all of you said uh, is about this idea of long, take, you know, taking a long view, uh, that we really have to be committed for this a long term. And I think something that you said earlier, Ted, that I want to kind of bring back uh, uh, to kind of set up the next question is this idea that, you know, this is, in fact, every, is it, is in everyone's economic interest to actually close the racial wealth gap. Uh, that the issues that we see particularly as it relates to the disparities in wealth has huge implications for society more broadly. And what I mean by that, we just released a report at AARP two days ago that looked at the differences in life expectancy, how long people actually live. And what we found was the fact that that cost the US 1.6 trillion if we do absolutely nothing to address the differences in life expectancy in 2030. In addition, because of those lost lives, those differences in life expectancy, you're looking at a loss of $1.1 trillion in consumer spending. So just those numbers added on to the work that JP Morgan has done and many other organizations have done, that this is really in everyone's economic interest to address the issues of the wealth gap. There's the human cost and there's the more economic implications more broadly. So I guess if you were to kind of step back from your corporate roles and think about the broader landscape in terms of addressing the issues of the racial wealth gap by supporting entrepreneurs of color, what do you think are the opportunities? What are the opportunities ahead to move faster or to accelerate the pace of change? I'll start. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head chain, you know, in terms of like the actual indicators of the reduction in the wealth gap, in the wealth gap, we know that 5% of black Americans hold business equity, which is the, a, a key driver of wealth compared to that of, you know, 15% of white Americans. And business ownership has the potential to build wealth, wealth for entire communities. And at the same time, we also know the majority of black owned businesses are sole proprietorships. Mm -hmm. um, for those that want to become employer firms, I think that's where um, there is a lot of opportunity. And that's where you start to see that economic mobility shift from one household to another and to another. Um, and so from my observation, just based on learnings and having been an entrepreneur myself, um, I think there's a misconception that black owned businesses specifically want to play small. Um, there are definitely those that intend to remain as a small business, um, you know, how it's technically defined, but many intend to compete with their mainstream peers, but just need opportunities afforded to them. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that I'm working towards to create those opportunities. And that's key for business owners to have success. Um, and so I think about, you know, places in the world where that may be lacking in terms of opportunity. And I think bringing some of these investments to more rural parts of the country may be a next and necessary step. Um, they're often overlooked, but very fertile grounds. There are lots of reports that, you know, indicate how fertile the South is specifically for entrepreneurship. So more place-based investments um, that aren't solely servicing the urban meccas of the world, I think is an opportunity to accelerate change as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll I'll come back to a point also that Janice made. I mean, I do, I, I agree with you, Jean, that I think it's clear that an inclusive and equitable economy benefits everyone. And I guess the two things I'd say is that I think um, um, that if, major companies um, and major nonprofits are, are thinking about this issue very intentionally in each aspect of the work we do, that that, that, that is going to help. Whether it's the way you invest, whether it's how you build community inside your companies, whether it's how you, how you designate your philanthropic um, investments or the programs you take on, to really keep this front of mind and on a, in a sustained way, I think is powerful. And some companies have been doing this um, clearly, as um, as Monique and Ted have pointed out. I mean, some companies have been on the on the forefront of this, and certainly nonprofits. There are many nonprofits and and advocates who have been on the forefront. The second thing I would say is that the nonprofit, private sector, and public sector partnership capacity, I think, is still untapped. And I'll go back to Janice's point about coordination. There's a lot of resources that are flowing all over the place based on companies and nonprofits and frankly governments, you know, particular plans and where they see the impact. 
and more the more work we can do to coordinate that um i think and to really um we can we can create a, a huge amount more impact by really collaborating more closely together yeah the, the good thing about going last franz is i can just riff off of what what you and monique say <laughs> But I, I, I can't agree more with the notion that, look, if you just look at, you know, three, four individuals on this, in this discussion, uh, Gene, I think if we coordinated better together, just the four of us, think of how we might be able to aim the resources of our institutions for, for greater good. Um, so it's a really great point um, around collective action and coordination. Uh, and I would double down on um, where you were headed, Monique, around the really how just how incredible um how many credible businesses we have run by americans uh, and in particular run by people of color i, I think it, we are discounting um, the ingenuity the resilience the perseverance that um these businesses have exhibited over the last two years to still be around if you're around or to to to, to form in the 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 uh, during a pandemic i mean it it I have several examples um, that I won't bore you with right now, but of how diverse firms have, you know, been, uh, you know, really rooted in local communities, but have been instrumental to our own operations, whether it be personal protective equipment or supporting our real estate properties or helping us, um, you know, with specialized kind of marketing needs, uh, professionals. I mean, it, the list goes on and on. And so, you know, these firms have knowledge of the landscape. Many do want to um, compete and to, uh, to operate um, at, a, at scale, but are currently subscale because of a lack of opportunity or, or navigation or both. So it just, it never ceases to amaze me how many of these companies come through in the clutch and, and are resilient. Um, but I, I would point to one, um, and you, this triggered my, my thought process, Gene, when you mentioned life expectancy, which is really um, concerning uh, for a number of reasons um, and the, the disparity there, but an, an obvious opportunity where there's really great data around is around business ownership transfer um, and mm -hmm. the intersection of ownership transfer of business and uh, the, the racial wealth gap. It's business ownership transfer is an underutilized, underappreciated method of starting and growing a company, or at least growing a company. And given the silver tsunami of retiring professionals and business owners, you know the the kind of cultural and wealth transfer um, that could take place if we took more advantage of ownership transfers could be a really positive solution. And so I think it's a place that, frankly, we could spend more time investing and supporting. Um, and so I would leave that as a potential opportunity yet to be tapped. Well, uh, before we leave, we have about maybe two minutes left. So this is gonna be a fire round. Uh, we have leaders both in terms of corporate America that's on this call, advocates that's uh, watching uh, and listening to this conversation. And I think that we all have a responsibility to really address these issues and close the wealth gap. As a leader, what is one thing you would recommend for those who are listening to this conversation that they could potentially do in order to help move us closer and closer uh, to eliminating the racial wealth gap? Well, I'll jump in because uh, I think it's, I think I would really just want to reiterate a point I made. Wherever you are, whether it's at a, in a university, in a nonprofit, in a company, in government, keep, put this issue front of mind, keep raising it focus on it there we have to we have to do this in a sustained way over time ted monique yeah i would i would say uh support diverse and businesses owned by people of color um that is one way that you can particularly during the course of a very tough pandemic support um, your local communities uh, and support the kinds of firms that um, certainly could use uh, your resources and your support um, as they navigate this really difficult time. And Monique? Ted stole mine. So in addition <laughs> to supporting your local businesses, I would say, um, you know, 
open your own door. So for those of us who have the ability to um, offer contracts, to offer advice, to offer um, just our expertise to come to the table and help people navigate and give them the tools and information. I think that, you know, we think that all this information is accessible that we've learned over time, but in order for folks to kind of you know, break into the ivory tower, they need a little bit of a playbook and a manual at times. So if you have the ability to, you know, even ask your suppliers, okay, what are you doing to get more diversity in your um, vendors and contracts? I think we have the ability to ask the question and at least you set the table to have a conversation and try to get more folks in the door. Well, thank you so much, Monique, Franz, and Ted. Really appreciate the insights and the strategies and the tips and the call to action that you just shared. I'm going to go now and turn it over to my colleague, Tammy, who's going to introduce the next panel. Wow. Hearing from you, all of you gives me so much hope. A heartfelt thanks to uh, Janice Bowdler and Franz Pasha from PayPal and Ted Archer from JP Morgan and Monique Carswell from Walmart.org. And of course, Thank you, Jean and ARP, for your partnership and leadership to narrow the uh, pervasive health and wealth gaps. Grateful not only for your time and insights this afternoon, but frankly, for the commitment and the passion that each of you brings to narrowing the racial wealth gap and serving small businesses. Um, I am now delighted to welcome the extraordinary Samantha Tweedy, the inaugural president of the Black Economic Alliance Foundation, the, the nation's leading organization harnessing the collective expertise and influence of Black leaders and allies to build generational wealth for the Black community, who will moderate our next panel. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here. Uh, today's event began by acknowledging that we're having this conversation during Black History Month and acknowledging it's a conversation that we need to be having every single day. What I would add is acknowledging that it's also happening at a time where there's significant effort underway across our country to prevent the telling of truth about our history and about how our history leads us to where we are today. And telling the truth about what our economic structure is and what our economic infrastructure is and what our economic infrastructure isn't yet, as all of the panelists who've spoken today have been doing in different ways, is so critically important. The truth is, under America's current economic infrastructure, the gap between Black and white home ownership rates are wider today than under Jim Crow, that the typical white family has over eight times the wealth of the typical black family and that almost 70% of middle-class black children are projected to fall out of the middle-class adults. Important to today's conversation, the truth is also that discriminatory financing and underbanking coupled with less wealth in the black community in the first place force the average black entrepreneurs to start out with almost three times less in overall capital when compared to new white owned businesses. And that Federal Reserve data from 2020 shows us that only 26% of black business owners received the full amount of financing they sought from banks compared to over half of white business owners. And the truth is that the staggering disparities of which those are just the short list uh, that are facing Black communities, communities of color across our country and entrepreneurship in every area of our economy are due to the structural policies that have been created, that have been sustained over generations across the public and the private sector. And as Janice Bowdler spoke to us about earlier, that the only way right, the only way that we are going to get at the kind of true change to the economic infrastructure is if we are working across both those public and private sectors, and that we're doing so with a reprioritization, a new prioritization, where first and foremost, we are dedicated to flipping that economic infrastructure on its head so that it's prioritizing an inclusive economy and an economy that works for all, and that we're doing so at every turn. So thank you again uh, to Reimagine Main Street and to AARP for bringing together this conversation of leaders across sectors 
Uh, and I am thrilled, beyond thrilled, to be able to moderate the next conversation with an unparalleled set of leaders who are at the forefront of helping us understand the truth when it comes to, yes, the challenges, but also the real actionable, big, bold solutions that we can be thinking about when we are thinking about what happens next, what can happen next, what should happen next to advance businesses owned by entrepreneurs of color uh, as part of strategies to close the racial wealth gap. And so since we wanna get right into that conversation about where we are gonna head from here, uh, I've asked each of our incredible panelists to do a bit of an introduction about who they are and what their work is as part of the first questions uh, that we will dive into today. So Tynesha uh, Boye Robinson of Cap EQ, I'd love to be able to come to you first. So tell us, uh, Ty, what is the path to 1555 campaign and why does it matter to this work? Thank you so much, Samantha. So PAC to 1555 is an effort to fuel black business growth. And it comes from a report that's re been referenced several times on this conversation, that if 15% of existing black businesses could hire at least one employee, it would result in $55 billion to the economy. Now that's the floor, not the ceiling. What we've learned from our Brookings Institution re report is that if black businesses achieve parity, that could be closer to six trillion dollars. And so part of the reason why it's important is all everything that was outlined in the panel before that this economic value is not just for black people, it's for our economy, it's for the United States. Uh, and it's something that is long overdue. And the reason why Cappy Q partners on this work and helps support it, thanks in partnership with Cerna Foundation and others, is because Cappy Q is an impact investing and advisory firm. And we are having a vision of changing how the world does business. And we do that in partnership with investors and companies at the intersection of DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And we do that to make sure that we're embedding equitable impact into day-to-day -day practice. And what we mean by embedding equitable impact is that this work is not bolted on, it's built in. Thanks for having me. There's so much to come back to there, but we are just going to get everyone into the conversation first. So uh, Patrice Green of the Certina Foundation, let me come over to you next. So the Inclusive Economies team at the Certina Foundation is deeply focused on both Black and Latino entrepreneurs, as well as investment and support ecosystem for those businesses. So just talk to us a little bit about how your work intersects with the kind of corporate commitments um, that we've been discussing to those entrepreneurs and those businesses. Thank you, Samantha, um, and always great to follow Ty and all of her, her energy. Um, really excited to be here. Um, as Samantha said, I'm with the, the CERNA Foundation, and our mission is to foster just and sustainable communities across the United States, guided by principles of social justice and distinguished, distinguished by healthy environments, um, thriving cultures and inclusive economies. Um, and we do that through centering racial equity. Um, so really with a focus on democratic participation, wealth creation and accountability for policymakers and governments to communities of color and low wealth communities. Um, and for the inclusive economies team, you know, our program is focused on supporting um, the conditions and opportunities necessary for Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities to really maximize their, their ability to be leaders, creators, and innovators in all sectors of the economy. Um, so really, we see ourselves as, you know, how do we actually help to shift and shape the container um, for which folks are able to then connect and utilize these corporate commitments? Um, in addition to that, we also um, support the work that is looking to do just the conversation that we're having today. How do we actually make sure that folks are accountable for what they say they're going to do and to those communities? So that looks like, you know, supporting folks like Just Capital, who will follow, um, and um, folks like uh, Good Jobs First, who are looking at, like, how do we use subsidies? What does that look like across um, federal subsidies, um, state subsidies, where is that showing up? 
how are corporations sort of using federal dollars and where does that show up and are these dollars actually landing directly in community? Um, I'm really excited to be here. We had lots of main streets called out. I started out my career um, on the main streets. I'll call out Lancaster Avenue and Market Street in Philadelphia. Um, so really coming from a place of looking and working with mom and pop businesses all the way up to really looking at how do we support and build out the ecosystems um, that are necessary to support those folks in doing the work they do every day. But to um, Ted's point, not everybody wants to stay at that level. Folks want to be able to grow. And part of what we're doing at the Inclusive Economies Program is really looking at how do we create those on-ramps, those pathways, those opportunities to access or shifting and creating innovative capital models to make sure that Black, Brown, and Indigenous um, entrepreneurs can get there. Thank you, Patrice, and you all do not need me. You don't even need segues uh, from one speaker to the next because next we are going to uh, Ashley Marshad Form from Just Capital. So Ashley, uh, we know that Just Capital believes that providing tools and resources to corporate leaders creates the kind of incentives and the kind of momentum for companies to act. So tell us about the work to track corporate actions and performance to advance racial equity. Absolutely. Thank you, Samantha. So great to be with you and the rest of the panelists here. I serve as the Director of Corporate Equity at Just Capital, which is a nonprofit that aims to build an economy that works for all Americans. And we do that by helping companies improve how they serve all stakeholders, including workers, customers, communities, the environment, and shareholders. And our research rankings, our indexes, and our tools help to measure and improve corporate performance in the stakeholder economy. One of those tools is our corporate racial equity tracker, and I'll provide a link to this a little bit later, but we looked at six categories related to corporate racial equity practices at the 100 largest employers in the United States. And I can share more about what we found a little bit later, but want to frame this with a couple quick data points based on our polling of the American public. We worked with the Harris Poll last year on a survey that found that 78% of Americans said that they believe it's important for large companies to advance racial equity by supporting their local communities, by sourcing products or services for minority-owned businesses, and donating to schools or scholarship programs. But we also found that 84% of Americans agreed that companies often hide behind very public declarations of support for stakeholders, but don't necessarily walk the walk. So I'm excited we're going to get to talk today a little bit more about the importance of, of walking the walk. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, and Michelle Juwando of the Amidiar Network, uh, last but never, never least, uh, in your role, you and your team focus on reimagining capitalism pluralism in a democratic society and, and related issues. You also served as part of the leadership team for Google's public policy uh, group, which I know you'll tell us a bit about. So you have these multiple vantage points that matter. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit from you about how the work you do informs your views of corporate commitments to supporting entrepreneurs of color as part of those broader commitments to racial equity. Thank you so much, Samantha. And um, I just have to say that this beautiful panel of dynamic, brave women, right at the end of Black History Month, going into Women's History Month, well done, well done, and excellent coordination. Um, so uh, I'm Michelle Jawando at Omidyar Network, and Omidyar is a social change venture. Um, so that means that we use some of the same um, tools that we use in the foundations, grants, and investments. But we also look at what are all of the resources and tools available. So that means making um, investments and in ventures that we find promising, commissioning research and convening coalitions from the world of business and culture and advocacy and philanthropy. I think I believe I'm showing up today in as a multi-sector player. I've spent, I'm a lawyer by training, but I've spent time in the public sector and government. I've spent time in nonprofit and advocacy world and in corporate um, uh, business world and now in philanthropy. And I think the unique vantage that shows up across all of those places in those worlds, no one has quite figured it out and everyone is trying. And so I think that would be the first thing and first admonition that I would make. 
just do something. I think oftentimes when we look at these multi, uh, multi-year, multi multi-generational issues, there's an overwhelming sense of, well, if I don't do one thing, then I'm not going to be the leader, the worldwide leader on this issue. Sometimes you just have to start with one thing. So our team really looks at how do you look at structural change across these crucial social issues like growing wealth inequality, breakdowns in community cohesion, and then Thinking about what are the policy changes that can also incentivize or make or create accountability mechanisms for us to move forward in the fashion that I think all of us here are connected. Um, I know we're going to have a much larger conversation, but I wanted to leave with this point. Um, Colin Mayer of Oxford University has this beautiful quote, the purpose of business is to create profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet, not to profit by creating problems for people and planet. And so I think even as we're entering this conversation today, we all have to think about what are the fundamental shifts in the rules and the governance that are governing markets today? How can we change our frame to more of a stakeholder mentality and not just a shareholder mentality? And what does it mean to show up um, justly, inclusively, thinking about the world that we're creating, not right now, but for 50, 100 years from now, for not just the people, but also the planet. So thank you so much and really excited about being here with you all today. Uh, thank you all for starting us all the way up here. I will say, I feel like we're going to need six hours for this conversation instead of, you know, the next whatever 20 odd minutes we have, but it's okay. We'll do what we can. So we just had the benefit of hearing from a lot of our colleagues who are doing incredible work within the corporate sector and you all to steer, to steal Patrice's words, you know, you all are in this place where you're shifting and shaping the container for that work. And I would add to that also being able, therefore, to have just a different perspective, right? A different way and a lens through which to analyze all of the activity in that container. So we're going to spend most of our time thinking about where we head next, but just for a beat, reflect for us on the recent wave of corporate commitments to narrowing the racial wealth gap that are about supporting entrepreneurs of color. And tell us, where do you see the most promise? Are there blind spots? Are there missed opportunities that you've already observed? And anyone can jump in to start with this one. But I also spent a lot of years as an elementary school uh, head of school, and I'm happy to cold call. So jump in fast. I, I, I will. I, I I will jump in because I hate to be called on. <laughs> Thanks, Samantha. Um, you know, I really want to say that I I think that what we heard in the last panel were some really great examples of partnerships that worked well. Um, and I mean, I'm always excited to hear when um, partners who are in my portfolio are are showing up. Um, but the partnership between AEO and PayPal and Ty reference. No, AEO has been a um, a long time supporter and champion for small businesses. And I think the reality is, is that what we saw with that partnership is that PayPal sort of taking this big commitment that they had and going straight to a trusted source in the community um, and giving them the space and the on-ramp to really do the work to make sure that those dollars and the most needed of dollars in terms of that granting got down and onto the ground. Um, equally with that, what I will say is that you know, if there are a lot of questions um, for whether they are my grantee partners, whether they are um, the entrepreneurs they serve in terms of like, where are these dollars landing? Um, so I think it's really still a question of, are these dollars actually hitting the street? And are they hitting the street in a way that um, really is the most useful um, for communities? And and I'll just follow up on, on that um, incredibly thoughtful thread that Patrice just laid. So, so much of the work is about how do we communicate transparently what these commitments really look like on the ground. And I think sometimes that's, if, if we're honest, we're like so excited when we see these robust commitments, but what happens two and three and four years later? And so I think there's an, both an opportunity and a challenge that we find ourselves. So the first is how do we ensure that there are multiple players and levels to ensure follow through and accountability? So corporations themselves can do this by setting up measures of what success for them looks like. And again, going back to my first point, just start and do something and then share what you're doing in a timely fashion 
action so that people have a sense of what these commitments look like for you. I think entrepreneurs and communities um, need to have programs that are targeted, that are connected to folks who are on the ground doing this work. And if you can't part to local partnerships, if you can't talk to um, local entrepreneurs who have some evidence of what these commitments are, then I think it's it's a fair question to ask around accountability. And so thankful for folks like Ty and Ashley who are engaged in that work in creating real partnership for many of these commitments. And finally, I think philanthropy can show up in thinking about our role as convener. We have an opportunity to bring different voices at multiple stages of the process. And so part of our work has to transparently sharing that and also thinking about different ways that we can bring uh, different unique novel voices together in service of this work. I'm happy to jump in quickly there, Michelle. You you set, set me up almost too well. I'm going to pull that thread through around transparency and communication. I mentioned earlier that Just Capital last year launched its corporate racial equity tracker. Well, we looked at whether or not companies disclose policies on supplier diversity and local sourcing. What we found was 34 out of the 100 largest companies that we looked at had a local sourcing policy. 84 companies had a supplier diversity policy, and there were about 30 companies that had actually both of those policies. Now, for many of the companies that had both of those policies, companies like Target and UPS, they seem to more intentionally see each of those elements of local sourcing and supplier diversity as being elements that benefit not only stakeholders, but have direct business benefits, which I think is important. They also seem to be acknowledging that communities are a key stakeholder group for them. But overall, there's certainly room for improvement in terms of what companies are disclosing to help us understand you know, whether or not they have policies and what those policies actually are. Um, but also note quickly that along with our partners, FSG and PolicyLink, we published last year the 2021 CEO Blueprint for Racial Equity. And that was a report that offered a number of recommendations for companies wanting to advance racial equity. And one of those recommendations included um, collecting and publicly sharing data on suppliers led by people of color as a portion of your overall supply chain. So that's just another opportunity for Im improvement in terms of what companies can think about sharing. And disclosure, of course, isn't everything, but that at least gives us an opening for some communication and conversation about goals and, and how to get there on the journey. And Samantha, I'm going to keep your job easy and continue this thread of building on each other because we, Kathy Q, worked with Ashley on the corporate racial equity as part of the corporate racial equity alliance. And the uh, recommendations about procurement actually came because of the path to 1555 work. And so one of the things that's a bright spot for me is, you know, we heard Ted say earlier about needing you could build it or you could buy it when you think about black business growth. And so you're seeing more nuanced solutions around what would it look like to build it and what does it look like to buy it. And I think an example of that is the Cincinnati Minority Business Accelerator. It created a portfolio of 67 minority owned businesses that have created 3,500 jobs and over $1.5 billion in aggregate annual revenue. And they did that in partnership with local companies. So really taking the Brookings Institution report that we did about Path to 1555 and Black business growth and seeing where are the areas where Black businesses and businesses of color are underrepresented in the supply chain of corporations and building a true strategy and partnership with local communities. So I think that's one bright spot. Another bright spot, though, I think is we need to be mindful that Black businesses like Black people are not a monolith. And so what we're seeing is that there is Black business growth happening outside of the walls, purview, and influence of big, large corporations. In fact, the most recent Path to 1555 report that we um, released in partnership with Brookings showed that there was a 25% surge in Black business growth with micro businesses. And when you look at the geeky people who do this for a living, they said that was statistically significant. It was not just because we were getting laid off disproportionately, which we were. It was a result of the policies of having more money in our pocket and more time because of not traveling. In addition to that, that actually helped us unleash the, the ingenuity and creativity in ways that we don't get to when we're oppressed and suppressed. And so I think that leads to what I think is a challenge or a thorn is really that capital markets don't see us. Capital markets see us oftentimes as more risky, 
Um, when they do give us money, they often give it to us as worse terms. And so I think that's something when you think about, you know, what can JP Morgan Chase do, but also what can large corporations do, financial institutions and, and retail services alike, is really think about how is capital landing in a way that's, that's actually helping support and drive and fuel Black business growth. So you tie in your first uh, response, you talked a little bit about the difference between the floor and the ceiling, right? And I think it gets to this idea of, right, what are we, ju yes, just go do it, right, Michelle? And once folks are just go going out and doing it, right, what are we then able to look back and say we want to see more of? And so you touched on this a bit, but one of these big questions that has been so important, you know, as of late, and certainly is a question for us to think about across sectors is about accountability. Is there sufficient accountability? Is the accountability that we see in place right now, the accountability that's really going to make a difference, that's really going to matter when we think about the authentic commitments to entrepreneurs of color and the meaningful follow through that we want to see there? So, so what other thoughts do you have on that? How are we making sure that we're thinking, yes, start, get to it, right? Let's think about that floor. And then what does it look like for us to think about that ceiling, right? Or that sky's the limit when we think about accountability that's really going to matter? Anyone want to start? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think uh, the short answer, um, do we have it in place? No, we don't. Um, I do think that a lot of what we've heard um, from the folks on this call is, we have a lot of the tools um, and those tools are actually like most of those tools are not coming um, out of corporations. They're not coming out of government. Um, I think to Franz's point um, in, in the earlier panel, they're coming out of um, the nonprofit, they're coming out of the social impact sector and folks like Atai and Cappy Q who are really sort of in partnership and have come out of community or coming through community and are building some of those tools. And I think part of that um, failing to see is not just of the entrepreneurs, um, particularly Black entrepreneurs, particularly Black women entrepreneurs, but also um, of the support systems. Um, we support an organization, Black Innovation Alliance, that is again another place that is building that container that is bringing together um, innovation support organizations and entrepreneurship support organizations to help them be able to do that advocacy, to be able to say, these are the measures that actually work for our communities. Um, so I think we have, we're have, we have those tools coming, Policy Link and Just Capital, we have those tools coming together, but we need, we have to really take this opportunity to say, how do we actually sort of uh, attach them and streamline them? And that we begin to look at it as a holistic system. Because part of what we've traditionally done is we're looking at someone's diversity program or their procurement program. And when, and when, and when businesses don't succeed um, through those programs, it sort of just quashes those, those programs, as opposed to saying, if you actually go and um, interact with any of the folks on this call or the folks that they've mentioned, or the business support organizations that are black led or people of color led, they're iterating to figure out and going either up or downstream to figure out why it is that this doesn't work and, and then shifting to make that solution happen. Corporations may not be able to do that on their own, but to the earlier point, and I think to, to Michelle's point, we have to, we have to actually think about this as an ecosystem issue. And so you may not be able to do it on your own, but then how do you figure out where else you need to go? How do you open up your aperture to say, I may not have it in my sector, but let me be talking to people. Let me be in community and having conversations so I can figure out where to go next, because that's what we're asking our entrepreneurs to do. So we should be able to do that ourselves as well. A, a, a point just to follow up that this is really the beginning of a conversation in the beginning of a movement and i and i'm going to be as bold to say a movement because i think what we've seen over the last really five years is a shift on how we think about what is endemic to the core of your business and if we're smart we recognize we will continue to diversify as a country and if we don't think about how we shift and change how we bring 
bring people into the overall ecosystem, businesses will not be successful. And the best businesses will rise to that occasion and they will think about this as not just a thing to do on the side, not to take Patrice's analogy, not let me segment the supplier diversity from DEI work. This is how do you think about this holistically? And I'm, I'm thankful to Cappy Q, to Just Capital and so many who are making that story real and whole for folks. I think if you look at places like New York City, city where you're seeing institutional investors, especially public pension funds and trustees, lean into the power that they have downstream. So looking at capital value change, looking at ways to increase disclosures, pushing for diversity on boards. You think about organizations like ELC who push for diversity on boards. Um, we saw in 2021 more than 50% of racial equity audit proposals received greater than 30% support which is unique for the first time for those proposals. It's not where we want to be by any means, but it is a start and it is building momentum around a broader conversation. Um, the, the last piece that I will add here is there's also an imperative for us to figure this out, to change social fragmentation. That so often we think about corporations here, business here, entrepreneurs here, startups here in the community, when in fact we know that that's not really how the world works, that actually at different points in your life, you may be the entrepreneur, you may go and work at the company, you live in a community. And so really shifting our mindsets to think about this from a holistic frame is something that we're aspiring to do. We're pushing other partners in this work to really think about the whole of the ecosystem in order for us to have the type of change that we need to see. <clears throat> so whole of the ecosystem, accountability, uh, embedding, and just doing something, uh, but making sure we are real honest, right, and telling the truth about what is the floor and what is the ceiling. With our last couple of minutes, I told you this would fly by, uh, is magic wand time. So I'm going to come to each of you short and sweet. You've got your magic wand, whether it's inside the container, whether it's shaping the container, whether it's shifting the container, you wave your magic wand. What do we see when we look ahead to what happens next? And let me start with you, Ty. You know, I, I believe capital has been the biggest fueler and driver of inequity in our, in our country for a really long time. And so one piece of that magic wand to me is capital landing with the brilliance and the boldness of Black people, because we've seen from the data that that lands in our communities. So that would be something I would love to see. Ashley. Well, I think my answer to this is, is pretty straightforward and maybe a little sneaky. I think that companies have an opportunity right now to take advantage of the tools that are available to help drive greater equity. So my, my thought is just companies, corporate leaders should really take advantage of the tools, the, the great research that's out there. I mentioned a few tools today that are just going to be uh, linked again in the chat box soon, but you know, we've worked with our partners very closely on developing things like um, you know, the racial equity tracker. We've developed tools like the, you know, the CEO blueprint um, that Ty was mentioning earlier. And then we're also in the process of developing corporate performance standards on racial equity. And we welcome companies to use those tools and to engage with us in this work. Patrice. Yeah, I think if, if I waved a magic wand, what would we see? We wouldn't be talking about parity. Like we would, like that would, that we could like, literally get rid of that word and the way that resources, um, people, place, dollars are enacted such that what we're really doing is um, dreaming and creating the future immediately um, in real time. Michelle. Waving my wand, two quick things. Uh, entrepreneurs of color have greater agency and power in the same way that we see large companies really showing up. And also that we see Black, Indigenous, people of color, entrepreneurs and startup founders really being brought in at the table from the beginning, not forget the table, at the door, directly into the design of how corporate commitments should really look like. That's it. Uh, so, uh, 
AARP and Reimagine Main Street, you heard it here first. We will be back next month uh, for Women's History Month. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, thank you um, to these brilliant, strategic, and tremendous leaders. It's been so good to be in conversation with you. And I'm just looking forward to all the work ahead. And thank you again to AARP and to Reimagine Main Street for today's event. We are grateful. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Susan. Samantha, thank you. This has been so I want to say there were certain things that people said that I wrote down as quotes because they were so amazing. Ultimately, this is about closing the racial wealth gap. Uh, an inclusive and equitable economy benefits everyone. We need collective action and coordination. No one has figured it out, but everyone is trying. Just start and do something. I think those are all just amazing lessons, and this has just been a phenomenal experience. So thank you all so much, and we so appreciate your joining us today. So uh, th so thank you, and have a wonderful day.